Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Well, welcome everybody to our latest Answers from the Lab podcast. A very special guest today that will be joining us. Uh, recently, we've heard from Drs. Monroe and Rubin at Progentech about their novel testing for lupus that we're making available through Mayo Clinic Laboratories. And I have the distinct pleasure today to be joined by Dr. Thomas, uh, who is an expert in both managing patients with autoimmune disorders and, and, and uh, also uh, helping to treat them. And so making the diagnosis and treatment. Uh, today, Dr. Thomas, we'd kind of just get, like to get your insights and experiences in managing patients with lupus and also what role lab testing needs to play, uh, could play now with some of the innovations that we're seeing, at, such as that brought forward by Progentech and kind of, and, 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 you know, the role of the, of the lab and, and helping you as a clinician and helping your patients. So I guess to start off with, you know, I think lupus is a, is a disease, a disorder that's not always well understood even by those in medical circles. So just, first of all, welcome. And second of all, maybe just to start off with a little bit about, you know, lupus from your perspective as a rheumatologist. Uh, sure. So, so systemic lupus, uh, the full name is systemic lupus erythematosus. Erythematosus is the medical term for um, redness because a lot of our patients will get pink or reddish colored uh, rashes. Uh, lupus comes from the Latin word for wolf because back in the Middle Ages, uh, they uh, called diseases where there were open sores on the body, lupus like a uh, like a wolf was eating away at, at, the, at, at the skin, and it's systemic in that it can attack any organ system of the body. Um, first off, it's a, it's a genetic disease, uh, Dr. Maurice. Peep, we've identified over 180 genes that predispose people to having lupus. Uh, the more genes you inherit, the more likely it is to develop the d disease, and then some genes are more likely to cause it than others. But most people who get the genes never develop the disease. It takes something to trigger and turn on those genes. And just for example, um, ultraviolet light, uh, too much sun on a trip to Bermuda, for example, could, could trigger it. Uh, cigarette smoking uh, could trigger it. There's a lot of different triggers associated with it. Now, there's a lot of different systemic autoimmune diseases. So how do we tell the difference between lupus and one of the other ones, for example, rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, Sjogren's disease, scleroderma. Um, there's uh, systemic lupus. Um, one of the hallmarks is that there's positive autoantibodies uh, where the person's immune system can't tell the difference between foreign invaders and their own healthy tissues. And the person's body actually makes antibodies that think that their own tissues don't belong there and attack them. Just a good example is anti-double-stranded DNA. I'm sitting here underneath these lights. I'm wearing sunscreen, but nonetheless, the ultraviolet light contacts my skin, damages cells underneath the skin. They release their contents like DNA. The person with lupus, their anti-DNA thinks it's a foreign invader, attaches to it, goes throughout the body to cause inflammation in different organs. Um, another hallmark of the disease is, is uh, something called complement consumption. A lot of our pa uh, patients will have low complements as part of their disease process. And then there are certain antibodies that can tell, uh, tell it apart from other systemic autoimmune diseases like anti-double-stranded DNA, anti-Smith antibody, anti-ribosomal P antibody, um, and anti-phospholipid antibodies and low complements. And then there are certain manifestations that can help set it apart. For example, biopsy-proven lupus nephritis, uh, low platelet counts, um, something called autoimmune hemolytic anemia, where the immune system attacks the red blood cells. Uh, and then, of course, cutaneous lupus, like the classic butterfly rash that our patients get. Um, and then there's three different classification criteria that we can use for research purposes, but they can help guide clinicians in helping to make the diagnosis. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating Got disease because every patient's different. Yeah, it sounds pretty complex. I mean, it, just in terms of, of, of identifying patients clinically, if it can have so many different manifestations. And I'm actually, my PhD is in immunology, and I, I'm, I'm very fascinated. But I mean, people, it's difficult. People, we think of our immune system, but we don't recognize it. Really, that whole system is predicated on 
distinguishing self from non-self. And it's very, you know, it's the disorders we see is when that balance is not quite right. And in this case, it sounds like it's not. Um, I actually, I remember when I was in college, one of my college friends was getting, had, she had a, an odd rash after being in the sun. She was diagnosed with lupus. I didn't know, had no idea what it was. I mean, how do patients tip with all these different potential manifestations, how, how do they typically present? Uh, sure, uh, Dr. Maurice, that's a, a good question. You know, if I lined up a hundred of my patients, every single one of them would be different. And that's one of the complexities mm. of lupus. One person might co come into the hospital with blood clots and a stroke and, and fatigue. Uh, someone else might have a lot of protein in their urine and uh, chest pain from pleurisy. Someone else could just have some low blood counts picked up um, just on some routine blood testing, but feel amazing. Um, and that's because lupus can attack any single organ system uh, of the body. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that people were born with genes that cause it, and there's triggers that turn it on. And then the disease, the immune system just starts to gradually in increase over time. And people might start off with just very vague symptoms like fatigue and tiredness and some joint achiness. And, uh, um, and that might be their first manifestations, but it's impossible to diagnose lupus at such a young, young stage like that. But it'd be really nice if we had better laboratory tests where we could identify patients earlier on until they, and, 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 ex well, let me rephrase that. Um, it would be nice to be able to identify patients early on like that instead of when they're already having severe problems like uh, lupus nephritis, where it's attacking their kidneys and already causing damage. Yeah, no, you, this, I mean, it's certainly as someone that's a laboratory and, you know, clinician laboratory, and you think about the role, how do we develop tests that give patients and their physicians uh, insights into what's going on? Because that's, it's always the unknown, particularly in a younger patient that might have, you know, a variety of different Presenting, presenting signs and symptoms as you as you describe, having the lab be available to help inform like what's going on. And you mentioned many already, double stranded DNA and some of the other antibodies that you look for. Um, of course, we we're here in the context of Progentech, and they you know they have both a, a, a flare a risk index test which they've come out with, as well as disease activity, which you nicely touched on. Maybe specifically your thoughts on, on those tests and how they might. What, what, they're, what they're useful for and how they help you as a clinician manage and a rheumatologist managing these lupus patients. Sure. You know, one thing I like to mention even before I talk about that, Dr. Maurice, is that our laboratory tests for lupus are downright horrible. Um, when we look at all the tests I just mentioned, all of them were discovered in the 1960s and older. All of them are close to 60 years old. And there's a great difficulty with getting better laboratory tests, um, FDA approved and approved by CMS and the insurance companies. And a big prob uh, reason for that is the, uh, is the pr difficult process. It's hard for um, biotech companies to have the money to get things approved, you know, very different than big pharma, which has uh, tons of money to do it. So we're, we have a desperate need for better laboratory tests like the Progentic test. Right now, it takes an average of anywhere from four to six years to diagnose someone with systemic lupus from the onset of their symptoms. And the longer it takes to diagnose them, the more apt it is that they're going to have permanent uh, damage. And that increases their risk of mortality, which lupus patients are three times more likely to die compared to their peers because of the disease. So we need better tests. And so thankfully we're getting better tests like the Progentic tests. Um, so I have, a, I have had a chance to use um, these tests and one of them is called the lupus flare um, uh, test. We really don't have a great way to be able to predict if someone's gonna flare or not. Before this test, all we really had were like the, the anti-double-stranded DNA. If we see it rising over time, or if we see the C3 or C4 complements decreasing over time, that can give us a clue that someone might flare, but you have to test them several times in a row. You know, that might take nine months and in order to see that. But the lupus flare uh, test, it measures a lot of different parts of the immune system, 
And it's been shown that abnormalities occur in the immune system before the person actually has a clinical flare. And just one patient I can think of is I was following one of my patients who was in clinical remission on therapy and his flare test came back uh, highly positive and which kind of surprised me. And so that spurred me to talk to him and come to find out he was missing doses of his immunosuppressant called mycophenolate mofetil. He wasn't using his sunscreen religiously, which is an important medicine uh, for lupus. He was under a lot of stress. And so I talked to him about if he doesn't doesn't work harder on treating his uh, lupus, he's at high risk of flaring. So he worked on all of those things, as well as doing other things I recommended, such as getting enough sleep, um, eating an anti-inflammatory diet. And, uh, and then he did really, really well. And he did not flare. In fact, he felt better um, than he had been feeling and didn't realize that he was probably on the verge of a flare anyways. And then the lupus disease activity test is a better test for checking disease activity. When I have a patient sitting in front of me and they're having symptoms or problems, the big question I have is, is this due to their lupus or is this due to something else? And I have to confirm uh, whether it's lupus or not because the treatments may be very different. A huge problem with tests like complements, for example, you know, when in, in systemic lupus, it's a, we call it a complement consumption disease. Um, C3 and C4 complement are consumed during the inflammation. And so we look for low levels, but they're only helpful in 20% of our patients. And that's all um, because the liver is churning out a ton of C3 and C4 and it balances it out in most of our patients. And then the other big test we monitor is anti-double-stranded DNA, but the yearly prevalence of a positive anti-double-stranded DNA is only about uh, 25 to 30%. So most of our patients are not helped by these particular tests that we re rely upon so much. So the lupus disease activity uh, test also measures lots of different parts of the immune system, and it can actually give us a score that tells us whether someone is at low risk moderate risk or high risk of having active disease. And I just clearly remember two patients who always had normal complements, always had normal anti-double-stranded DNA. Both of them had horrible joint pains, tenderness of the joints, horrible fatigue, not sleeping. So my big question I had is, is this their lupus or is this their something called fibromyalgia? And they're treated completely differently. And their uh, lupus uh, disease activity test came back with low probability of disease activity. And I felt much more comfortable treating those patients with talking about exercise, sleep, and using medicines uh, such as duloxetine to uh, calm down the pain nerves of the body. Other than, otherwise, the other treatment, if it would have been lupus, would be immunosuppressant. So it helped out incredibly with those two patients. And so I'm really excited about these tests. Yeah, that's really great. Well, so this will be a chance for you. Well, first of all, that's fantastic. And to make sure that I understand it so you can educate me real time here. But I mean, so I mean, my understanding as you describe it is. First of all, the tests are the same ones I was taught about in medical school, and I went to medical school in the late 80s and early 90s, to your point, um, and, until this. And really, the approach was much more the lab signals that a patient had lupus, but then you measured clinical activity really by end organ symptomatology, right? By, by the damage that was occurring in the tissues, which is exactly what you don't want, because immune responses are geared up to, be, to, to really grow. Um, and so what you want to do is, and it's like, it's like trying to stop a train on the tracks is my understanding that you can use less of the immunosuppressive therapies if you intervene earlier, and you can also prevent the end organ damage, which to your point is irreversible. So it sounds like these tests are really helping where there was really no great way for you to get those insights prior. Did I, did I, did my understanding it correctly? I guess is my question to you. One, 100%, uh, Dr. Maurice. Um, and uh, the, the quicker we can uh, treat people, you hit it on the, on the nail on the head, the faster we can treat patients early on in disease, the less strong medicines we had to use. It, it, just one a quick example, I just read a research article that looked at uh, organ damage in our lupus patients. And it, when they looked at patients from the uh, 1970s to the 2000s, where a lot more steroids were used, by just a few years into their disease, 
most patients had a permanent organ damage and 50% of that organ damage was due to the very medications we were using, which wow. is steroids. Uh, the other 50% was the disease it's, itself. If we can use safer medicines earlier on, it can make a big difference. Compare that to more recent data, um, and it shows that um, significantly less patients have organ damage from steroids because we're using better medications earlier on, but it's still not good enough. We, we need to diagnose these patients much earlier than we are and use better medications and safer medications. Yeah, no, it's very, yeah. I mean, it's really, it's really coming very clear with, you know, your you're describing your experiences for your patients, for you and your patients. I mean, my question is how old, I mean, when how old is someone typically when they're diagnosed with lupus? Is it, my understanding is not a, it's not a disease of the, of the age. It's four years earlier in life. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. The, the most common patient would be a female in childbearing years. The reason for that is that a lot of the genes are on the X chromosome, uh, but all, so they get a double dose of these genes already. But also, um, uh, these genes don't tend to turn off inside of the cells. You know, usually when you have two X chromosomes, one turns off, but they, these genes stay, stay alive and are active. But then estrogen increases immune system activity. Mm. So, so that's where most of our patients are at. However, we have patients as young as several years old, three years old, all the way up into their, my oldest present presenting patient, I think was 85. So they're, it's all over the place. The early, younger patients, by the way, more likely are because of um, genes that directly affect the immune system. For example, a mutation of the complement system. And that's almost guaranteed to give that young boy or young girl uh, systemic lupus. And so that's where we see those younger patients come from. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, pa patients uh, from uh, from several years old all the way up into their 80s. Wow. And you take that, you know, um, that range of ages, right? And and think about what you mentioned earlier, that it can take several years to make the right diagnosis. And over that time, there's damage happening to the patient's organs, which might be irreversible. And also there might be a, a, such an activity of disease that the actual medicines can exacerbate or cause other organ damage. So, I mean, it really, as someone that's in the laboratory and, and I'm, I'm very passionate around innovation, it shows the need to innovate in this space so that we can serve patients. I mean, the fact that when I just think of any disease taking anywhere several years to diagnose, it just, it just really screams to me, we have to continue to innovate to get better tools. Um, and, and, and then you, and you talk about, and, and the, the, the ultimate end state effect is their increased risk of dying. I mean, that's just something that we really, from a laboratory, uh, from a clinical perspective as diagnosticians and therapy pe people managing and treating patients, it's something we have to, we should really be vigilant about, you know, and, and passionate about for the sake of our patients, I think. So I, I, I assume you would agree with that. I hope so anyways, but. Yes, yes, absolutely. We, we, we definitely need a better laboratory system and getting uh, better labs approved and into the hands of clinicians and patients so we can diagnose patients earlier, diagnose them more accurately, because there's a lot of patients out there with diagnosed with lupus who do not have lupus. And there's a lot of patients out there with uh, diagnosed with fibromyalgia who actually have lupus and are not being treated appropriately. So we have a huge unmet need for better laboratory tests. Yes. Yeah. And now, and that's why it's very, first of all, thank you for your time today. And thank you for sharing your experiences. And, and you know, and that's for me personally, it, that's why we're really excited to be working with Progentic on this, because it's one thing to have the, a, they're, they're innovating, they're creating the new tests. And then with us as Mayo Clinic working with them can not only make them more available, but can take knowledge that people like you and others have, and also have the knowledge about how, the best way to use them to really impact people's lives in a positive way. Uh, there's information I believe that's underneath that should be as part of this podcast around, uh, you know, links that'll be available. If they have questions about how to order them or want more information, but uh, you know, your your voice on behalf of you and, the, and your practice and your patients is the kind of things that really energizes me in my role at Mayo Clinic Laboratories to, to make those available. So so thank you again for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you and keep up the wonderful work, Dr. Maurice. Well, I'll do my best. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.